Now, who, who were the Buddha's colleagues in that global era? Arnold Toynbee, the famous British historian, wrote 12 volumes of world history. Surveying Eurasia during that time, the mid first millennium before the common era, he came up with a theory following a German historian called the Axial Age around the middle of that first millennium. And at that time, 2,500 years ago, he noted that the great Greeks, the pre Socratics, Heraclides, then Socrates and his school, the Platonic school, then in Miran, you had Zoroaster providing the codes for the Achaemenid Empire. In Babylon, the Deutero Isaiah led the group that collected the Jewish Bible. In India, the Upanishadic sages like Yajnavalkya, who rebelled against the ritualism of the Vedic uh, tradition, ritual tradition. It was not really to be called Hinduism yet, but I call it Vedism. Then you had Mahavira, who founded Jainism, and Shakyamuni Buddha, who founded Buddhism. And finally, in China, you had Confucius and Lao Tzu, who did the same work and provided the codes for the Zhou Emperor, in Zhou Empire. The point for us is, in looking at the history of the Buddhist tradition, is that Toynbee considered the Buddha, and Toynbee was no Buddhist, he was a Brit British historian, he considered the Buddha the most successful of all the Axial Age reformers, what he called. He called them ethical reformers rather than sort of religious founders or something. Because he considered that their main job was to try to tame the power mad warrior kings, the Agamemnons and so forth, who were backed up by their high priests, but had become too dangerous with their wealth, weaponry, and large population, somewhat beginnings of urbanization, specialized soldiers, merchants, artisans, farmers, etc. So they, their, their old warrior ethic, you know, of two, two warriors like two buck, you know, uh, goats or something banging horns in the spring, you know, for dominance. When it's armed up with a city, with soldiers and, and iron weapons and so forth, it's just too, too genocidal and destructive, like the Trojan War, for example. And they had that same type of thing amongst the city-states in India and in China also and in Iran. So, so thus, Toynbee demystified the Buddha and recognized him as one example of such a reformer. So when we, as we are looking at this during this course, we were thinking of the Buddha's teaching as kind of like a Socratic teaching, like a Confucian teaching, as sort of trying to set up new codes for more urbanized, more pluralistic societies where the individual has to figure out what the meaning of life is more for themselves. And of those, Toynbee considered the Buddha the most successful, and probably so, not necessarily because he was so much brighter than any of the others, but because the society was more tolerant and more willing to have people, you know, becoming unconventional and challenging the old warrior tribal codes that uh, the pre-city-state societies were operated on. So all of these people spoke of gaining wisdom from investigating reality as being the purpose of human life, along with the development of justice and ethics in order to live together in cities and in larger you know, societies, not just small tribes. They spoke of generosity as essential economically to, to people not to hoard, to people with power not to hoard everything and create destitute people. Spoke of nonviolence and gentleness because that people at war all the time, then you can't really farm, you can't make any creative, you can't have, develop prosperity. So all of these are qualities needed for harmonious life in tribally pluralistic cities all essential for human civilization. Remember, civilization comes from Kiwis, which means a city. You know? We are still trying to learn the lessons of these great Axial Age reformers today, which is why their names in our Euro-American case, the Greek and the Jewish ones, are carved on our buildings still today. That is to say, it is still questionable as to whether we are indeed yet civilized, since we don't necessarily live up to Socratic ethics, to the Plato's New Republic, etc. We still don't necessarily live up to the ideals of the great Greek and Hebrew teachers of this era. Just as in India and in China, they don't necessarily live up to the, all the Buddha's great teachings. But in, the process, in order to understand this though, based on the discoveries of Toynbee, etc., there is a team of historians who analyzed the trends of axial age city-state societies 
which I will assign to you, will be assigned to you in the assignments for this, for this uh, MOOC series. And they saw four problems, the way they analyzed it, they saw four problems besetting the city-state societies of the time. And the problems that they faced were those of, A, militarism and materialism. You know, the materialism of the growing merchant classes and the militarism of the warriors who, you know, were using their old militaristic ethic too powerfully because of having large standing armies and things, and not just winning some territory or something, but destroying the neighboring city-state completely, like the destruction of Troy, you know. Then B, elitism and political cynicism. You know, the upper classes became very ossified, and they just had power in its own sake. Remember, you have Socrates challenging Themistocles about might doesn't make right, so that's the second problem. Then C, traditionalism and ritualistic formalism. So whatever the ancestors did, that's what we have to do. And then with any problem, you go and do a ritual in the temple, and then the gods will help you. And that's what you don't think about anything else. And then, and then D, proletarianization, what they call, these are historians, you, can't, you have to forgive them the term, <laughs> and cultural alienation, meaning that the majority of the people in the society are kind of alienated. They don't get to go to the high parties. They don't, don't get to go to the best temples, uh, the best rituals. And they're sort of made into a kind of a pro, a proles, you know, meaning commoners who just serve. They're like slaves, almost like slaves, but basically lower classes. In India, they were called lower caste or even outcast people that they had who were not any kind of caste. So the response is that these ethical age reformers, according to these Toynbee following historians, they taught were the need for A, moral sensitivity and ethical dualism to respond to the militarism and so forth. Existen B, existential humanism and internal transformation. So in other words, the individual could change themselves. They could be more humanistic and be more ethical. You know? C, historical nemesis and reinterpretation. So here you talk about you reinterpret history not to just tell you what the ancestors did, but you hold up an ideal ancestor. Confucius was big on that, and Buddha told many stories of that kind, of how an ancestor had behaved better than the people in the present time. And so the people in the present time should reform themselves rather than just follow some you know, rigid ancestor who, behaved, who gave them license to behave badly. So reinterpreting history was C, and D, individual and universal social amelioration through scientific and moral education. And that dealt with the large mass of alienated people. And in the case of Buddha, particularly, uh, Toynbee admired the fact that he drew from the, the, the non-twice-born classes, as they were called, or the low caste people in India. And they had, through his order, they had access to education, access to individual self-transformation, access to enlightenment, actually, which before was completely reserved maybe only for the high priest class and maybe some of the warrior class. Though all such generalizations, of course, are always prone to exceptions, this scheme is useful to approach the Buddha as a lead figure in this era, paradigmatic in the Eurasia-wide axial age transformation. It's really important to get it out of the context of this is just some religious founder who you know, just sort of made a, some belief system the way that Buddhism is located conventionally in academia in a religion department, and it's just sort of a religion, you know. But rather, we see it as an overall social transformation that's part of the whole Eurasia-wide change discerned by historians uh, that still we're undergoing in a way. We're still going that today. One of my students in one of my classes years ago pleased me a lot by making a joke when they came in for a class uh, walking across the Columbia campus and looking up at Butler Library, the big library there. And they said, Professor Thurman, I see what you mean about our sort of Eurasia-centric, uh, Euro-centric way of being here. I looked up at the library and I saw carved all the names up on the library and I decided it looked like a Greek restaurant. <laughs> he said, I'm sorry, I really liked it. I always like it and it always keeps me, my, me aware of this idea of cultural expansion and, our, and showing the interconnectedness of Eurasian city-state societies, all, even in that ancient time, even though they didn't have United Airlines or whatever, you know, BA, British Airways. So in terms of the general responses, the Buddha taught 
that humans of all classes and genders were equal in, in, their, in principle, in their ability to access their higher life purpose. And, and to use a rational causality, actually, to transform themselves into civilized persons, that is, persons suitable to live peacefully in a city, and thereby to fulfill the highest ideals of their ancestral species, as well as to overcome the suffering caused by the savagery of uncontrolled self-centeredness. So, which they all were teaching, and the Buddha sort of got away with more of that teaching, was Toynbee's point. He was able to found a bigger school. There was a larger economic surplus to support with scholarships the people who dropped out of their inherited professions and the women who just had to stay in the family because that was the role of the women and be able to actually educate and liberate their minds from these sort of traditional strictures, you know, within their sort of caste-ridden society. You know. Worthy of mention here is that the insightful sociological theories of modernity's personality constellation, as the sociologists say, such as those of Max Weber, Peter Berger, etc., typifying, typifying, uh, typified as exhibiting a peculiarly intense level of A, instability of identity, because you're not in one small little village tribe. You know, you're in a city where different people have different stories about what a person is, you know. B, reflectiveness and rationality. So you have to kind of weigh them and figure things out and be, figure out what you are. And C, of individuality, you kind of not just, uh, just repeating whatever your parents did in your tribe. And D, of dealing with alienation and trying to find a way of fitting into life. Uh, these fit rather well. That's how they describe modernity, actually. But they fit rather well, not only with today's zeitgeist, you could say, but also with the changes in the developing city-states of the axial age time, eliciting the responses of the Buddha and his colleagues. And that is why, in the core curriculum of a place like Harvard or Columbia or Yale or whatever, you start studying Socrates and you read the Jewish Bible and you read the, uh, you deal with those classic things. They still are something we are trying to live up to even today actually. And so in a way, in a way with the Buddha, we are encountering sort of the Eurasia wide version of this rather than just the Mediterranean version of this. Notice of the word Mediterranean, middle of the earth. Each of them, the Indian, the Iranian, the Chinese, and the Mediterranean, they all thought they were the middle of the earth. And we find out from Toynbee and today that they're, that the middle is everywhere, or something like that. So that's, we're really looking at ourselves here in looking at this, in this course of learning about Buddha's teaching. The four insignia of the Buddha's teaching themselves, focusing analysis on responding to impermanence by detachment, to suffering and its causes by therapeutic analysis, to selflessness by individual self-reconstruction, and to alienation by cultivating liberative openness to freedom. They are very connectable to such current trends in personality formation. Thus, we moderns are still trying to tame ourselves. And, you know, the, the Buddhist word for education is to tame yourself, like become like not a wild horse, but one that can have a saddle and go in the right direction. You know? So to tame ourselves and our societies, our self-recognition as postmodern perhaps being an admission that cognitively we are still not yet that different from the ancients.